Under pressure to plant the potatoes before the spring rains return, Alex and stable hand Megan Elliott are using shire horse Tom to plough deep furrows into the soil. But working at such a pace soon takes its toll on the young shire. Steady. Steady, boy. Steady. Just steady, steady. it's all right. It's all right. Steady. Steady. Ooh, Tom, Tom, Tom steady. whoa. Steady. 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 Stay out of his way. Whoa, 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 whoa. Good boy, it's all right. Is he all right? Yeah, you're all right. Yeah, I'm OK. Just <laughs> about. The roller was in the way and I tried to turn him. And Tom doesn't like chains anyway around his back end and his leg. And he got upset. Just one of those the things that happen, you know, that's what makes these things sometimes quite dangerous. Right, well, the best thing we can do with him is to get yeah, him straight back fine. to work. Come on, lad. Come over. Come over. Are you going to get this muck, then? Yeah. It's going to be several cartloads, isn't it? Don't worry, Peter. Hopefully, <laughs> by the time him. you've got a cartload of muck, they'll be... It'll, yeah. it'll be... We'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> See you in a bit. Good luck. See you in a bit. To feed the potatoes, the team will need at least 10 tonnes of well-rotted horse dung. I always feel like a little muck miner doing this. So is this the job you envisioned yourself doing on Mother's Day? I don't really care because I'm outdoors and it's not raining. Where's your daughter? That is a good question. No. In the cottage, Ruth's daughter Eve is busy cooking a simnel cake, a traditional gift for Mothering Sunday. All your currants and raisins and candied peel. Mum's always been very partial to candied peel. Celebrated on the fourth Sunday of Lent, Mothering Sunday was an important occasion in the Edwardian calendar. For daughters especially, many of whom worked away in service, it was the only time in the year when they returned home. So I'm going to do it the way Mum's always done it. She does a layer of cake mixture and then a layer of marzipan, and then another layer of cake mixture, and then bake it, and then right at the end, when it's come out of the oven, spread some apricot jam on, because it's mine and mum's favourite, and then do another layer of marzipan over the top. So that... It's now going to end up in the oven as quickly as possible so the mum doesn't notice that I've done something nice and I hope she sees it that way. Ready? Yeah, you're looking, looking perfect. In the arable field, Alex's ploughing has not been going to plan. Oh, that is that's terrible. <laughs> I've seen better ridging in my time. The major problem is, of course, when the weeds start to grow through, well, the idea here is that you take the horse down the furrow and, and you pull a huge hoe. So the straighter your lines are now, the less work you've got to do back in, later on in the year when the weeds start growing. Go on, lad. Steady. I'm creating problems. I haven't got time to practice. We've only really got one shot at this. It's said, all in farming for you. Reasonably straight. They look good. There's a slight kink in the field, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's what it, it is. What do you mean a kink well, in I the think field? There's a, there's a hedge bank or something's been grubbed out or a ditch, uh, and when it goes through it, it sort of goes like that, and that's why it's, there's a kink. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember that one. There's that's the best the excuse I've heard. <laughs> right. I'd wonder if you want to go ahead and start getting the um, potatoes. Yeah, sure. Do you want the tatties in the dung, yeah? Tatties in the dung, yeah. I can tatties, do tatties in the, in the dung. dung. Sounds like an Irish pub. To feed and nourish the potatoes, the team are using horse dung. But here in the Tamar Valley, Edwardians often used an altogether different type of fertiliser. Traditionally, the market gardens and the uh, farms around here would have used dock dung, and this is dung that's brought up from the dockside down in Plymouth. 
And that kind of stuff can be made up of, of just about anything, you know, any waste from a city. As you can imagine, you've got a lot of human waste going into this dung, but you've also got a lot of horses there working in the cities, so all of their dung as well. And, of course, all, all of the, um, the food waste, midden, basically, all the waste from the cities would be piled onto barges, brought up the River Tamar, offloaded at the quayside, and brought right up onto the fields. But, unfortunately, we don't have barge loads of human excrement to lay our hands on. So we've had to make do with a good old-fashioned farmyard manure. Tatties have been chitted, which just means left out with a tiny bit of light so that they sprout slightly. And they've already started their life, so, you know, that just gives us a bit of a head start, really. A couple of weeks' advance. Each shoot will give rise to new plants, and all being well, an abundance of new potatoes. If the team can harvest them in July, earlier than most growers in Edwardian Britain, they can expect to earn an extra £10 an acre. How long until we get results? Three, four weeks, we should start seeing the shoots, something like that. Mm. And then we've just got to pile a bit more earth on top of them, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, potatoes, famous for blight. Mm. Um, and and blight is famous for happening in damp and wet conditions. Exactly. <laughs> so we've just got to hope that we get some dry weather. <sighs> Could do with a cuppa, though. I've been thinking about a cuppa for hours, I'll tell you. Hi. Oh, Hello. Oh, oh, murder a cup of tea. Mm. How are you doing? Thank you. That's what you've been doing this afternoon. Yeah. So the planting. Oh, and I thought you were off skiving. Well, I was. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Simple. count the little balls. Eleven balls for the eleven disciples without Judas. One in the middle for Jesus. Although once saved for Easter, by the Edwardian age, it had become customary to eat simnel cake on Mothering Sunday. Sticky and stodgy, that's how I like it. But well, we made some fantastic finds, didn't we, out there? Mm. This... Archaeologist Alex has unearthed some artefacts. He believes to be remnants from the city dock dung laid by his farming predecessors. I quite like this. Mm. The thin clay pipe. Yeah, it's, really mm. it's lovely, isn't it? The fact that it still survived. So, Remarkable. It's so delicate, isn't it? The, the, the most interesting thing about it is we cop fascinatingly. We managed to find two coins which give us two rough dates really when this was happening. Can you see if you can find the date on that one? And this one here says 1862, so we're smack bang in the middle of Victoria's reign. This one's 1929. Okay, so, so that's George. Yep. Yeah. George the yeah, V. It says George. So that's the sort of two ends of, yeah. of the sort of period that mm. this was being worked. Yeah, exactly. That coin might have even been mined. Here, you know, the copper. <laughs> Good weather. Thing. Quite cool, it coming home, yeah. wouldn't it? <laughs> Found its way back into the fields. Oh, that's, that's quite romantic, that. <laughs> it's mid March. Hiya. Hi, Ruth. And the team are already reaping the benefits of spring. Why are you alone? There. Yeah, eggs we can do, especially at this time of year. A flock of sheep has its first new member. There she is. Poet and me. Probably name a daffodil, a strawberry, market gardening. Yeah. But uh, the practical in me would probably name it A. A. <laughs> Lamb A. Lamb A. <laughs> Maybe Agnes. The team have also taken delivery of their new Dartmoor pony who they've decided to call Lad. Oh, isn't he cute? He's really pretty. Mm. Welcome to your new home. <laughs> Having spent his first four years living wild on Dartmoor, to work on the farm, Lad will need to be trained. Hey, laddie boy. Come here, Lad. Come on. Horse whispering. I think uh, it takes years of practice, Peter, and, ex and experience to take a wild animal off the moor 
and turn it into a working beast. You reckon we need some help then? I think we're almost certainly going to need some help. I think otherwise you'll be standing here for the rest of your life whispering in it. Alex has called in Mike Branch, a horse trainer from Tennessee. Mike is following in the footsteps of American farmer John Solomon Rary. In the 19th century, he found fame and fortune in Britain with his revolutionary method of taming wild horses. And what do you think of our pony then? It's a bit small, but looks really sharp. Just in off the moor. That's right, yep. yeah. Can you I take do. a look? Yeah, please do. Okay. <laughs> With horsepower still the major driving force in Edwardian Britain, horse trainers were in hot demand. Although most still used harsh physical methods of breaking the horse's will, John Solomon Rary and his followers turned to a more humane technique of using psychology and body language to tame horses. I'm kind of feeling his emotion and his body language and if I would feel that he was going to leave me say in two or three seconds from now I would try to leave him one second from now right. so that I'm the first one to leave I don't want him to get the notion that he can just walk off from me anytime and it's all right and kind of give him a superior feeling. Yeah. Right. He's really a nice pony. Seems to have a pretty good attitude. He seems to be thinking and <laughs> he's looking right at us. Yeah. He's an intelligent little guy. <laughs> Somebody's got to have the brains. Huh? <laughs> yeah. In the States, back at the turn of the century, I mean, someone in your position as a horse breaker, would you be doing it on a regular basis for farmers? And Yeah, yeah. But of course, most people over there are still at the turn of the century or breaking them out uh, by blindfolding the horse and getting on their back and pulling the blindfold off and uh, bucking it out. And when you finally get the horse rode out and uh, everybody's still alive, then you got a, got a broke horse. Uh, I'm getting a little old for that. And I don't think it really treats the horse fairly. I think if I can develop a relationship first off with the horse, hmm then he and I can understand each other a little bit better. Right, okay. Okay, let's ease back up there. I'm hoping that uh, by us uh, staying in here in the corral with him, that he's kind of adjusted to us a little bit. Mm. Certainly walked up to him a lot easier that time. He's a little bit fearful, so I'm gonna turn my energy away from him because I want to keep really, really low energy here because they pick up so much off of our body language. And yeah, this is much better because he's actually bringing his head over every now and then and smelling my back, smelling my arm. Yeah, and start reciprocating. That's very good. I didn't think he'd get close. No. Not, not this quickly. I thought all this whispering stuff was just, you know, sort of myth, but I can see just the the quietness and this gentle approach is really working, isn't it? While Mike begins the process of training Lad, in the cottage, Ruth is preparing for upcoming festivities. It's coming up to Easter, and our church has a tradition, as so many did, of giving out painted eggs at the Easter service. So seeing as Alex has got something of a glut on the go, I'll go up to making some coloured eggs. <laughs> 